All right, everyone. Welcome to our fall 2020 Health Sciences Regional Industry Advisory Meeting. Uh, my name is Jesse. I'm one of the project associates of Valley Vision. And um, yeah, today the our focus for the advisory is on the emergency medical services and emergency technician slash para paramedic industry or the EMS and EMT industry. Um, and yeah, we, you know, we're happy to have you all here. Let me figure this out. A few housekeeping points. Um, ensure that you know you all are muted. Uh, I think this would be geared more towards the panelists, uh, but make sure you're muted. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q and A. Um, or if you have any technical difficulties, uh, also you can put them on the chat box, as that might be faster to reply to. And then this meeting will be recorded. So, um, you know, it will be available um, just for for us to take notes for future um, distribution. So, and let me start the recording. All right, the recording is, recording is already going. And now I'll pass it on to uh, Trish, who's a Valley Vision uh, and she'll take it from here. Thank you very much, Jesse. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Trish from Valley Vision. I'm managing director. And Valley Vision is a regional nonprofit that supports our community partners on issues like developing the workforce for today and tomorrow. We work on behalf of the community colleges and the workforce boards and our system partners to help make sure that our students have good pathways into important occupations and that we are aligning our resources to the needs of employers. So the purpose of our regional advisory meetings is something that we're doing with the colleges and workforce boards across all of our main industry areas. So this is our meeting for our health services sector. And we were going to have this advisory meeting in the spring, kindly hosted by um, the fire department, Sacramento Fire Department, but we we're all pivoting. So we look forward to the opportunity when we can do that again in person, but we appreciate you all being here today to talk about the important needs of building a, a current and future workforce in this really critical occupation of emergency medical services, emergency technicians and paramedics. So uh, the information that we are going to see today is some new labor market information that is generated by our partner at the Center of Excellence, Ebony Benzing, will presenting new information for us to frame our conversation today. And then we're going to have a couple of special presentations by uh, leading experts and doctors in the field about what are emerging impacts and practices, especially related to impact of COVID and professional development and how people are able to manage through this uh, challenging time and what students and professionals need to know about what it's like working in this profession. And then we're going to have a panel discussion with um, various industry representatives from across various aspects of the profession. And we'll be um, discussing their workforce needs and partnerships and opportunities and suggestions for how the community colleges can, in particular, invest in strong workforce program dollars to meet the needs of both students and employers. And then I'd like to introduce you to Julie Holt, who is the Regional Director for Employer Engagement for the health services for the entire region. So this includes in our greater Sacramento region, three community college districts, seven colleges, plus uh, another college up in Lake Tahoe. So it's a big region to cover and Julie is our interface between our employer community and all the faculty and programs across the community college system. So Julie's gonna give us an update on some of the programs that relate to this occupation. So we're really excited to have you here today. We're looking forward to the discussions and presentations and hearing your ideas about how we build uh, valuable pathways. So thank you very much. I'd like to turn it over to Julie now. Thank you, Trish. Um, I'd like to do a huge shout out to Valley Vision for the team that's supporting this event and also to Los Rios and the North Far North for the strong workforce funds that are supporting our convening today. 
Uh, we've got high school pathways in the room. We've got community college faculty, um, as well as our administrative uh, support that comes from all of our colleges. And most importantly, we have our industry partners in the room. And I really want to recognize our first responders, uh, whether you are practicing, currently practicing or educating first responders. Uh, this is, like Trish was saying, a critical part of our community health. Um, and you all are resilient, um, amazing in this whole um, pandemic, and then it, as well as beyond the pandemic. But I really want to recognize that that is our focus here is to make sure we have a, an educated workforce that can transition into practice and really wanting to thank our first responders. I do want to just share one little piece of information from, um, I was thinking a little bit about when I was in college uh, in the 80s and HIV AIDS epidemic was emerging. And I was thinking in preparation for today, there was a lot of uncertainty. There was a lot of um, not understanding how the virus was working. Um, and so we're much in that same type of situation right now in our world. Uh, but I wanted to point out something very specific is that universal precautions became instituted in 1985. And this is important because when we transition students from our education places to work, our transition into practice, that uncertainty piece is something that um, is, is something we would like to address with our students. And how can we do that best by learning from our industry partners? So in connecting today, where our goals are to really to connect with industry, to understand what are your workforce needs, what are the gaps that we might be needing to address in our education system to help students transition, and then also look at any opportunities for um, strengthening these pathways into the workforce. So with that, I would like to just introduce Dr. Uh, Matt Maynard, or to introduce Ebony Benzing. Um, research manager for the North Far North Centers of Excellence is going to be sharing our labor market information. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. There we go. Oops. Went a little bit too far ahead. Um, so good afternoon again. My name is Ebony Joy Benzing. I am the research manager for the North Far North Centers of Excellence. Excellence. I'm here to share with you some labor market data regarding EMS or really uh, EMT and paramedic jobs. I'm hopeful that this data will provide you with some context about what's happening in our area regarding training for EMTs and paramedics, as well as highlight some areas where cross-agency collaboration would be helpful. First, a little bit about the Centers of Excellence for Labor Market Research. There are eight centers throughout the state and they serve nine regions. We also have a statewide center. Our collective mission is to provide labor market data and analyses to support community colleges and planning and implementing career education training. We also provide other types of special analyses such as in-depth sector analysis. And during the pandemic, we've been releasing regional economic impact reports. Some of the type of work that we typically engage in is focused on three primary questions. What is the employment outlook for students participating in a particular program? What skills and credentials are needed for entry into the labor market? And what programs look ripe for investment based on what's happening in our local labor markets? We look at multiple indicators for labor market, for the labor market, ranging from industry data to occupational and job data and job postings, et cetera. The goal here is to use data to better understand the conditions in our local labor markets. Our research provides one part of the puzzle when it comes to career education planning. Other components are just as valuable, if not more valuable, to form a more complete picture of what's, what's needed for our students to pick up the much needed knowledge, skills, and abilities for jobs that pay well in our region. 
The work that you're engaging in here today in this advisory meeting will add to our collective understanding of the system. Today, I see a little question perhaps in the chat. Sorry, pausing. Um, I'm gonna let Renee just kind of cue me in when the when the questions come in because I, uh, I will get I distracted otherwise. <laughs> Thank you, like I, I just you. did. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so today I'm going to present data that will give you an understanding of the demand for EMT and paramedic jobs across the greater Sacramento region. We're also going to take a look at some job postings data, which will serve to highlight what employers are looking for according to what's posted in the job postings. And finally, we'll look at educational supply from our colleges, which is used as an indicator to for how well employer needs are being met in the region. Um, to make this a little bit more interactive, I highly encourage you to throw out some questions because while I can chat and talk and just present data all day long, it's nice to have it broken up by questions every so often. So if you see something and you have a question, feel free to post it in the chat and Renee will uh, clue me into that question. So first up, when I first started to look into data for EMTs and paramedics, I realized that the skill sets that those workers have in particular weren't just limited to those roles. Oops, a little bit too fast. There are a variety of first responder occupations that may need to have some level of emergency medical training, including firefighters, law enforcement, and various EMS support roles. Rather than get the broad scope of skills for those who need these, uh, look at the broad set, uh, set of skills for people who need the skill set, in particular EMS, um, I decided to focus in on EMT and paramedic. The reason I'm doing this is because when we look at EMT and paramedic training programs, those are the jobs that students would be most qualified to perform or uh, find work in without additional training. Um, that's not to say that these programs do not train other workers. It's just that when we started thinking about target occupations and outcomes, it's helpful to kind of narrow it down just a little bit. It also uh, helps us, it keeps us from bringing in other data sets that can kind of confuse the picture a little bit more too. So here we have demand data for EMTs and paramedics in the seven county north slash greater Sacramento, Sacramento uh, region. I have a slight caveat about this data. The projection data that I'm showing here does not take into account the impact of the pandemic. This data is collected from a quarterly census of employers and the latest data set has just started to incorporate the first quarter of 2020, 2020. So that's from January to March. We most likely will not start to see impacts of the pandemic in our data set until January of 2021. With that said, in 2019, we had just over 1,500 EMT and paramedic jobs in the region. And once again, this is the North or Greater Sacramento region. And that includes El Dorado, Nevada, Placer, Sacramento, Sutter, Yolo, and Yuba counties. EMT and paramedic jobs are projected to grow by 12% over the next five years, adding nearly 200 new jobs in the region, across the region. As for now, there's an estimated 148 annual openings uh, per year over the next five years. And Median hourly wages are pretty awesome or pretty good at 20, just over $25 per hour. Um, this is significantly above what we like to track for the living wage for our region, which is around the $13.20 per hour. So nearly double that. Something interesting I found out about this occupation has to do with this value right here, this 0.79. This is the location quotient for jobs in our area. The location quotient tells us how concentrated jobs are in a particular region compared to the nation for those same jobs. In the case of EMTs and paramedics, the 0.79 location quotient is less than one. 
indicating that our area isn't exactly a hot spot for EMTs and paramedics. This lower than average number suggests that there might be some challenges with either workers finding employment or employees finding workers to fill those roles. In terms of demographics, we see that EMTs and, uh, EMTs and paramedic jobs are primarily staffed by workers who identify as white, which is about 65% of the current labor, uh, labor force and as male, which is also 65% of the current workers. Age-wise, with only 8% of workers aged 55 years old and up, retirement risk to the occupation is relatively low. We see most of our workers are concentrated in that 25 to 44 age range. Next, I am showing some data that comes from job postings through Burning Glass Labor Insights, which is an online job posting aggregator. This data gives us insight into what local employers are looking for, and it comes from online job postings. While not all jobs are posting on, posted online, analysis has shown that online job postings are significantly representative of the entire job posting universe, something like 90% plus of job postings end up online. So when I was looking at uh, looking for jobs for EMTs and paramedics, I came across 124 online job postings for those for that role in the last 12 months. That's from October 1st, 2019 through September 30th, 2020. Bethany, a question on whether those jobs are part-time or full-time? So I didn't look that far into it. Um, I could do a deeper dive on that, on that research and I'll just write that down and I'd be happy to send the answer out after this presentation. Okay, so here we see top locations and employers. Uh, based off of number of job postings. Uh, please note that this list is not exhaustive. So if you want to see the full list of all the locations and employers and all the other data uh, bits that I have, I'd be happy to send that out as a PDF as well. Um, locations with the most job postings included Sacramento and Grass Valley. And then we dropped down quite a bit to get to South Lake Tahoe and some other areas. And then Employers with the most job postings, surprisingly, unsurprisingly, are mostly health and medical transport companies, including Dignity Health, Sierra Nevada M Memorial, and American Medical Response. Some surprises in this list were Thunder Valley Casino and Aramark. Um, Aramark, I believe, works in the food industry predominantly. This data here shows the most requested certifications and skills by employers over the last 12 months. Top certifications included basic and advanced certifications such as basic cardiac life support versus advanced cardiac life support and pediatric life support. Uh, while most requests were in line with what I'd expect for EMTs and paramedics, one thing did catch my eye that I thought was kind of interesting, which is this casino gambling license. Um, that's very much attached to Thunder Valley and for individuals seeking work there, they have to be able to obtain clearance from the United Auburn Indian Gaming Agency, I believe, just to be able to work there. Um, skills were also in line with what I'd expect for paramedics and EMT. So patient care, CPR, life support, et cetera, et cetera. This right here shows the effort it takes for an employer to fill a particular job in our region. For EMTs and paramedics in particular, there was a medium level of demand based off the number of job postings. That's at 124 job postings. The time to fill a job vacancy was around 33 days, indicating that employers in our region have a much easier time filling these jobs relative to EMT and paramedics across the United States. 
And then again, we see another low, very low location quotient. Um, while this value right here, 0.5, is different than the one I showed you earlier, which is 0.79, what I want you to notice is that both values are below one, which indicates to me that below average uh, <clears throat> level of concentration of jobs in the area, and hence that some difficulty around hiring or getting people into those roles. Ebony, a quick question on that. This is my own question. Um, mm -hmm. So the location quotient, if it equals one, that means what? So if it equals one, it's on par with the nation in terms okay. of, yeah, job concentration. So the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if it's above that, then we have more specialization happening. We have a higher concentration of workers in the area compared Thank to the you. nation. Okay, so now I'm getting into some supply data. Here I have a list of EMT and paramedic training providers in the greater Sacramento region. I have to note, I wanna say that I don't feel like this list is very exhaustive. Um, I, I feel like there's been some changes in the last year or so um, because about a year ago, I wrote a report for EMTs particularly and I was able to find more uh, training providers or different ones or something like that. So this feels like a little bit truncated. Um, there, I have it broken out by training provider type. So I've got my community colleges, um, American River, Consumnes, Folsom Lake, and Sierra. I know that some of the other community colleges have had programs in the past. So I'm kind of curious as into if those programs are still operating or what's happening with them um, uh, because I didn't pull up any significant data regarding them. There's the continuing, the College of Continuing Education at Sac State, which offers both an EMT paramedic and a hybrid paramedic training program. We have private and CTI, which offers both the EMT and the paramedic training. And then a new program in our region. Um, I believe this has to have come into place within the last year or so, Project Heartbeat. Um, from what I know about Project Heartbeat is they're, they're headquartered in the Bay Area um, and I didn't see any data specific to this training center here in Sacramento um, about graduates or anything like that. So that tells me it might be a little bit newer. They just haven't reported anything just yet. Thanks, Ebony. We do have some comments in the chat that Woodland Community College and Yuba have programs as well. Yes. And then um, there was a question about how many jobs are filled by NCTI grads versus community colleges, but I think you just said there's no data there, correct? So I'm actually going to get into that in the next slide. Okay. So um, thank you for letting me know about Woodland and Yuba. I, I did find them. I came across something for them, but I was iffy on them, so I didn't include them on here. Um, and this is the primary reason why. So here you have a table of awards from the community colleges in our area. I'll speak to why I didn't include the other private training providers in the continuing education in just a second. Um, so this table shows the average number of words conferred per year over the last three academic years. You'll notice the three, three colleges in here, American River, Consumnes River, and Woodland in particular. So there's Woodland's awards right there. Um, whenever I am looking at, is there a regional need for training related to a particular occupation? I always take a look at what's happening award-wise or graduate-wise to estimate what our supply is. And based off the data I have here, I'm saying, hey, there's about 46 um, awards conferred per year just as a community college system. And then I would compare that to like the annual number of openings for an occupation. So uh, for EMTs and paramedics, that was about 150. And that to me suggests a gap. However, this data is really, really incomplete because of the differences in which the programs classify success. So for the community college system, we are looking at paper awards. That doesn't necessarily speak to the number of graduates, just how many awards are we giving out each year. Whereas the College of Continuing Education at Sac State, 
what they give me is information about the National Registry AMT examination pass rates. So I don't have a good apple to apples comparison there. And then NCTI talks about the number of graduates coming out of the program. So the amount, the level of data that I'm getting from each one of these programs is very different and makes it difficult to do that comparison. I see lots of chats coming in. So is there anything in there for me to answer, Renee? Yes, ma'am. There are, um, hold on a second here. Um, we have a comment from Sandy Fowler. We have a lot of students who take the course but do not apply for their certificate, thus the data is low. Okay. We have a question from Kim. What does awards reference? Mm -hmm. And then a question about jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So awards is like the paper thing. So like either the degree or the certificate. So that's how we're counting it in the community college. Um, Woodland, I noticed I didn't list them on my side previously, but then I see like the, I have awards for the 16, 17 year, but then it zeroes out in those um, other years. And that speaks to what Sandy was saying that they have students who are not applying for those awards. Um, this is how we're, tra we're tracking, hey, how are we meeting um, success? So there might be, need to be a conversation around how do we get students to actually get that paper thing until we figure out a better way to track students in other, other ways. Um, also a question about um, why Sierra College data is not included. I didn't see any. <laughs> um, so, and that's like a, a hint for me to reach out to, to Kim and say, hey, Kim, I did not see any awards data for Sierra College in, in Data Mart. So I will uh, reach out. And there's and also Anthony a comment. Oh, yes, excuse indeed. me, Renee. This is Trish. I just wanted to note that um, Julie prepared a, a list of the programs in the greater region. Awesome. So it does have the programs listed for Sierra, um, Lake Tahoe, and uh, Yuba Community College District. So Kim will be talking about those later. So that'll be, this is one reason we like to really have Ebony work with us on this so that we can get yes better input and update the data and have a truer picture of what's going on. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Thank That's you. why I like having you joining these meetings too. Um, so with all of that said, I do want to point out that I noticed something really interesting. Um, the state of California, and I have it linked right here, uh, Commission on Emergency Services. Uh, they had a meeting back in March and I linked their meeting notes where they have the pass rates for all of the EMT paramedic training programs across the state broken out by uh, EMS agency um, and institution. Um, so that would also give a comprehensive list to who is doing this type of training. And it includes fire agencies as well, I believe. Are there any other questions about this one? I think we are okay. There's some comments about different programs people are running, including Pools and Lake in the chat, but Great. no more yeah. questions. Okay, thank you. I'll take a look at those comments when I pop out of this. Um, so, um, and lastly, you know, just a different picture of awards coming out of the community college system. When I have apples to apples comparison for other institutions, I would include that data here just to see, hey, what type of program format looks to be most popular based off of what students end up doing. Um, so super incomplete picture, um, but it still hints to me that like that certificate that is somewhere in that six to less than 18 units is like the, the, the thing that people are looking to get if they are pursuing work as an EMT or a paramedic. So just something to think about. Um, that concludes my, my presentation for the day. Uh, you got to see a little bit of how like, I, I try to fit data pieces together and sometimes it doesn't come together very well. Like I missed some of the colleges because I wasn't sure if they actually had programs or not and stuff like that. But that's part of like working in this field. Um, if you have any questions or something comes up, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. There's my email address and there's a phone number, which will route to uh, my phone that I have here at home. I also encourage you to take a look at the COE website to see what new uh, presentations we have or reports we have coming up. So 
That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ebony, for sharing all of the information. Um, you know, we always are learning about more detail of uh, what's in our region, how are we servicing students, but that completion of award um, data is really, it's really tricky. Um, and it is a, something that we need to work on as a region and to get our information out. And um, again, Trish shared that we have all of the programs reflected in the handout that came out for all of the um, all the participants today. And I'll be going over that a little more detail um, later on in the presentation. I did wanna uh, now introduce our next um, person, I should say, um, actually Dr. Maynard. Um, he is currently on duty at uh, UC Davis Med Center and was unable to get away from the bedside today servicing patients. And so he was able to tape a presentation for us, which we are very excited about. Um, he is a captain in the U.S. Air Force and currently doing his fellowship in EMS services at UC Davis Health. He also attended UC Davis Med Center, um, UC Davis uh, uh, University for uh, his residency and his medical school. So I really, um, he's a doctor of osteopath and I would like to turn it over to Jesse to play the video for us. Yeah, let me stop screen and that. Hmm. Let's see. Hmm, that's odd. Okay. Okay, there you go. Can y'all see that the video? Yes, thanks, Jesse. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Everyone, my name is uh, Dr. Matthew Maynard. I'm a EMS fellow at UC Davis. Uh, I just wanted to, before I get started, give a brief overview of, of who I am and, and where I came from. Uh, and so I uh, was recently just asked to, to speak about COVID and how it relates to you know EMS and kind of get into some of the specifics of things that might be unique to our Sacramento area um, and things that I've experienced uh, during my time as the EMS fellow at uh, UC Davis. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about today was um, EMS and, and COVID and just kind of the, some of the, thi the things that we're doing uh, to educate our EMS personnel and as, as in this, this new age that we're, we're constantly learning to adapt and how to keep ourselves safe uh, and how to keep our patients safe and, and how to really operate and navigate in this, uh, this new complicated environment. So I thought I would give this uh, presentation or that I, that I go over with the, the fire crews when I work with them. Um, and as I go, I'll just kind of highlight a few things that might be unique to our area and uh, just some of maybe observations and opinions that, that I have. But I want to show this, this um, graph from the New York Times that they constantly update about COVID, just looking at it in our area. And so if you can see from this, uh, this graph here, you know, the amount of cases over the past two weeks has gone up 38% uh, in California. Uh, but our hospitalizations have been down 14%, but this number typically lags behind the number of cases uh, by a few days. So I expect this number of deaths and hospitalizations to go up over the next few days as the number of cases have increased. And so you can go down here, we can look specifically at Sacramento County, um, and we can see that in Sacramento County, our average daily cases is 153 cases a day uh, for, the, for the county. So, that's a pretty high, pretty high number, and the trend is, as you can see, going up, um, and I'm, I anticipate it going up um, throughout the, the winter months. Uh, and so, just something to consider that you know, COVID is is kind of gone. We've improved. We've been doing some some good work with social distancing, wearing our masks, but it's not going away anytime soon. I'm going to try and jump back to my slides here. So, let's see if we can. Get this to go. Uh, so now, uh, I think as far as you know, 
from an education standpoint, like what should we be teaching our uh, EMT and paramedic students? And really, I think the CDC is, has outlined pretty well, you know, what we should be teaching and uh, our, our EMS students. So my recommendation is just to stick to what the CDC has recommended. Uh, and so what they, the recommendations are that, you know, patients and family members need to be wearing their masks during the whole, during the entire encounter. And, you know, their exception for that is children under two years old and good luck getting any two year old to wear a face mask. But anyone that, that can wear a face mask but over two years old, you know, definitely they need to be wearing their face mask. Um, and as far as from the dispatch point of view, I don't think that this is being communicated. It may be, I haven't uh, been able to speak with the with people over at the Sac County Peace app about this, but um, you know, I think it'd be totally reasonable from just the initial um, uh, call into 911 that they're recommended to have a face mask on when the EMS crew arrives. And so uh, oftentimes what, what I've been finding in the field is that when we show up on scene, very rarely is the patient wearing their mask and the EMS will, will give them a mask but typically they don't get a mask until we're just about to roll into the emergency department because the emergency department is going to put a mask on them. Uh, but, but I argue, and we should be teaching our crews, you know, from the very beginning, if the patient can wear a mask, uh, if they don't have one, we should be putting it on from the very beginning. Um, and like we mentioned, I kind of hit on a little bit earlier, all EMS personnel, all fire personnel should be wearing their face mask while they're in service. Um, universal eye protection is uh, also key and, or critical for all EMS calls. You should make sure that uh, all of our EMTs, all of our paramedics, uh, no matter what the call is, are wearing their eye protection. Um, and I advocate for wearing eye protection that, that is not just, you know, simple glasses, although that definitely, you know, I think meets the standard and, and it is the bare minimum. But um, if there's any type of, uh, you know, air potential for an air slicing generating procedure, we should have a, a eye protection on that has some type of a gasket on it. And if I can, let's see if I can show here, I have an example of the mask that I wear while I'm working in the emergency department. Uh, this is an example of what I wear. And as you can see, there's this uh, red rubber gasket. It just prevents uh, air and particles from from entering into the into the mask there, and so air in, air into the um, to the goggles. So this is something if if your medics have the ability to have something like this, uh, I think this would be preferred. Uh, let me go back here. Um, and then just making sure that our our personnel are using proper hand hygiene and you know, using our rubbing alcohol or our hand sanitizer. But then if there's a known COVID person and we've been encountered with them, you know, we should make sure, I think in, in addition to just using the alcohol sand, hand sanitizer, take the time to really wash your hands, do the poll like 20 seconds, get them nice and clean before we you know, go on to do anything else um, to you know, clean the unit or, or we're going back in service or whatever it is. So uh, this is the next I wanted to touch on air slicing generating procedures. And so when you respond to a person that um, is, is presumed positive or could be positive for COVID, the standard is to, for um, contact droplet precaution PPE. And so what that includes is uh, eye protection, a face mask, your gown uh, and gloves. The mask does not have to be an N95 mask. Now, the caveat to that is if there's any type of air slicing generating procedure, the recommendation is to wear an N95 mask. And so what could be considered an air slicing generating procedure? That'd be a person who's getting a nebulizer treatment, person who's on uh, CPAP, or we're going to innovate somebody. Uh, so if there's any potential for any of those things, we should make sure that we, we have an N95 mask on. Um, one of the practical things that's kind of changed is our approach to airway management in, in this new age of COVID. And 
so one of the highest risk things that uh, our personnel can be doing in the field um, and, and in the hospital to expose themselves to coronavirus is uh, intubation. Uh, there's just an enormous amount of viral particles that are, are uh, spread into the air when we intubate somebody. And so with that, it's reasonable in, in, in our age and the recommendation that's gone out, um, I know among many of the, the providers in our area, you know, Metro Fire, AMR, have both really hit this home, is, is just to consider a superglottic airway right off the bat if a person needs intubation and just to, to don't even worry about um, direct or video uh, in, uh, endoscopy and standard intubation, just to go right for the superglottic airway. Uh, so here, everyone pretty much universally carries the eye gel. And so if you, you know, patients are unresponsive, or, you know, running a cardiac arrest or whatever it may be, just open up the mouth and throw that eye gel in right away and, and call it a day. Uh, and that's, that's completely reasonable. And that will actually, I think, provide a little bit better um, containment of the virus than if you were to continually bag the person all the way into the hospital. Uh, so something that has that definitely changed our EMS practice in the COVID era. Um, and then and the next thing is to discontinue any aerosolizing generating procedures before entering the receiving facility. Now, there's a lot of variation um, on this depending on the hospital for our area. So, you know, if the person is ex in extremis and they need CPAP, you know, they need, they need CPAP and our crew should should put them on it, making, make sure you're wearing your N95s, but there needs to be good communication with the hospital that, you know, hey, I've got someone in respiratory distress, they're on a CPAP. Um, we, you know, if you feel like they're really gonna decompensate, uh, if you take this, this CPAP off, make sure that's communicated in your radio report. Uh, and, and then they can kind of make the decision of what they want you to do when you get to the hospital and hopefully be able to communicate that to you um, before you get there. And then on the flip end of that, you know, they will be able to make arrangements to be able to uh, receive this patient in a, in a way that's going to expose the least amount of patients as possible. So, you know, some hospitals are really, you know, have, are strict about this. And if someone, they won't allow anyone in on CPAP, well, some of them might bend a little bit, um, but that just needs to be communicated. Uh, clearly with the, with the receiving facility. Another thing to think about is nebulizer treatments. If you, you know, if someone's like in not much distress and it might be someone who would benefit from a nebulizer treatment, but they don't 100%, you know, it's not, not going to really make or break anything. You might consider even deferring that until you get to the hospital where they can get in a negative pressure room and, and do that um, in, a, in a safer manner. Because when you're, nebula you're going to be nebulizing viral particle all over the back of that ambulance. And so, you know, if, if again, if it's someone that you think is would really, really benefit and would need it or, or urgently, go ahead and do it. But, um, you know, wearing your N95s. But if it's someone that you think can wait for a little bit, uh, just wait for the hospital. And a lot of times in the hospital, they're even deferring doing nebulizer treatments and just doing a bunch of meter dose inhaler um, you know, just using the meter dose inhaler to, to treat these patients. So uh, one little nuance that is, is, is new and, and applies to our area. Um, so some of the things that CDC recommends as well is to do our best to isolate the ambulance driver compartment and the patient compartment. And so, you know, there's a, a lot of times there's, it's just a full pass through or it could just be a window that slides open but there's ways that we can kind of isolate the two compartments. That's ideal because we want to keep the driver's compartment as a clean space because our uh, personnel are going to be in there all the time. And we want to do everything we can to try and uh, avoid contamination of the, of the driver compartment. And, and that goes for our crew. Like as soon as they get done with the call and decontaminating the back of the ambulance, they didn't make sure that they really, you know, wash their hands, that they're clean before they go back into the driver's compartment. And then uh, do everything we can to maximize ventilation at the back of the vehicle. And so uh, one interesting thing, that, or one thing that the CDC recommends and that you know, I've seen done in practice is to uh, you know, turn the ambulance ventilation on and then the driver up in the front will have the 
will change it so that the air isn't recirculated air in the vehicle, that it's air that's pulled from the outside. And so usually those ventilation um, exhaust ports are in the back of the ambulance. And so if we're, we're kind of in a way creating a negative pressure environment where we're drawing air in the front driver's compartment and that air is being pushed back into the, pa the passenger compartment and then uh, out the back of the ambulance. So it's one little way that we can you know, sort of simulate a, a negative pressure environment. Um, and then after we get done with the call, of someone that we think has COVID, you know, leave the doors open, let air exchange throughout the back of the ambulance. Make sure you're wearing your full PPE during decontamination of the ambulance. Um, and, you know, make sure we're using a good disinfectant. I don't think that's a problem or an issue with any of the uh, departments around here. Um, and uh, that's, uh, I think, enough on that. And then I'd just like to highlight the proper sequence for donning and doffing the uh, PPE. And so this is a slide directly from the CDC. I uh, recommend putting on the gown first, followed by the mask, followed by the goggles and face shield, and then your gloves. And then we're gonna take them off kind of in the, a little bit in the reverse order. Uh, we're gonna take the gloves off first, the goggles and the face shield. And this is an important part. Uh, make sure before you take your goggles off that you're decontaminating the goggles. Um, so, you know, grab that sandy wipe, totally disinfect as best you can, and then remove the goggles. I see so many times in the hospital and on the ambulance, we get done with a call, I'll take their goggles off and just put it on the seat or in the, wherever. And, and, you know, that could potentially have viral particles all over it. Now we've just contaminated whatever face we put it on. Um, so make sure it's clean before we take it off. You know, you know, take your gowns off and then take your respirator off. And these, the N95, if you use your N95, uh, on the call, if it's someone that's suspected of having COVID, that N95 needs to be thrown away and you need to get a new N95. Um, if you're using an elastomeric mask, I don't see that very often in the pre-hospital setting, but I have seen a few medics who do wear elastomeric mask. Uh, same thing with the goggles, that mask needs to be decontaminated uh, completely before uh, you take it off. And uh, then just make sure to wash your hands and use good, you know, or use a good uh, hand sanitizer uh, at the end, just kind of like we always do. Um, and so that's kind of the, the main, you know, gist that I give the medics here. Um, and just a, a few little, just one little thing I wanted to touch on too, that to kind of just make the medics and the EMTs aware is that uh, the procedure for even this ambulance crews uh, going into the emergency departments is, has varied depending on what hospital you go to. Like for instance, if you go to pretty much any digni dignity facility, uh, like you know, Mercy San Juan, Mercy General, they are going to you know, take your temperature and then give you a little badge for the day that say that you know, you're entering their facility and they've screened you for COVID. Uh, but that's not the case, uh, you know, they, they won't encounter that at Kaiser or UC Davis, and I, I haven't seen them do that at Sutter as well. Uh, so that's just something that some of the hospitals are screening, even EMS personnel, but, but not all of them are. Uh, one unique thing to Kaiser in this area is most of the Kaiser facilities has set up a area that's separate from the emergency department. So if you have a person who is suspected of having COVID, they won't, you will not go to the, uh, standard ambulance uh, receiving area. You'll go to a, a separate area. It's like these white tents that they've set up that they will, you know, screen and start initial treatment over in that area. Uh, but, but that's unique to Kaiser. None of the other hospitals have that in the area. Uh, so hopefully uh, that was useful to you. Uh, feel free to email me with any questions uh, that you may have. Um, I should have put it up on the screen, but uh, you can email me. It's just, it's mjmaynard at uh, ucdavis.edu. So that's mjmaynard at ucdavis.edu. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you have or give any additional insight or anything else I can help with. So just let me know. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Maynard's not here right now, but I really, um, we do appreciate his information. 
Uh, those are huge changes in practice. Um, no nebulizer or a limited nebulizer that used to be a go to for um, for any EMT um, paramedic in the field, as well as the airway management and then the donning and doffing of all of the PPE. It definitely intensifies um, uh, the entire process and the ventilation as well in the ambulance. So I'm hoping that those were useful pieces of information. Um, different different ways of practice at this point. So I'd like to transition to um, Trish uh, is going to be doing our panel today and we really um, are looking very forward to this. Thank you so much, Julie. And I want to just again thank Dr. Maynard and the, the dedication, the incredible um, commitment that people in the field have to keeping everybody safe and the value and importance of, of our first responders. And like Julie mentioned, all these changes in the field of practice are things that our students need to know about and our faculty. One of the things Julie and I talked about uh, was how people in this profession need to be adaptable. Um, so you can really just see that manifested through what Dr. Maynard said. So we have a fantastic panel today of practitioners in the field who are going to talk to us about the, uh, what's going on in the field of practice and what, the, what they're seeing in the workforce issues and the partnerships with um, school, schools and, um, and other partners. So I'd like to introduce Matt Burrell, Operations Manager from Alpha One Ambulance Medical Services, Kathy Ivey, EMS Specialist with Sacramento County EMS, and Kim Yanucci, Assistant Chief at Sacramento Fire Department, so I'm gonna ask them a series of questions and we're gonna have a facilitated conversation. And as noted, please put your questions in the, in the Q&A so that we can um, be able to direct questions and, and have an have a opportunity to mine the intelligence and wisdom of our panel. So first, uh, Matt, I'd like to start with you and ask you to provide a brief overview of the organization and what your role is, the kind of main services that you provide, and a little bit of background about your workforce. Thank you. Thank sure. you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, so Alpha One, uh, we've been around um, since 2011 in Sacramento County. And we service uh, a majority of the senior assisted living skilled nursing facilities um, around town. So the, a lot of the high risk groups. And we also are in conjunction with serving the uh, psychiatric um, line of care as well. So we, we run a significant amount of uh, the mental health population um, currently. So um, yeah, we're, the landscape of our industry uh, from our perspective has changed significantly since you know, COVID has started and I think everybody across the board, but the adaptability of our people has been absolutely amazing. And the support from Sacramento County EMS and the Mohawk and even uh, Cal OES has helped us get through this uh, tough phase. So, um, and we specifically, our company enjoy um, brand, brand new EMTs and paramedics, um, just from your perspective, from an educational standpoint. So uh, we have a, education system that's tailored towards those individuals. And um, we also enjoy experienced people too, but uh, we're open to all walks of life. So, um, and myself, I've been in this position for uh, roughly four to five years, but uh, personally I've been in EMS since uh, 2002, uh, working my way up the ranks. So um, that's me and uh, Alpha One in a nutshell. Thank you, Matt. Could you give us a sense, do you know about how many employees that you have? Yeah, we uh, currently we have um, 175 or 176 active employees. We just hired one today. And um, around anywhere between 35 to 45 paramedics and anywhere from 75 to 90 EMTs. Great, that's very helpful. Thank you, Matt. We'll come back to you in a minute now. So Kathy, in your role as EMS specialist for Sac County, could you give us the same overview that we just asked Matt for? Um, so I'm Kathy Ivey. I've been in EMS since uh, 1996 um, when I went through and uh, I worked in the field for about 
20, 20 years total before coming into the EMS agency. The Sacramento County EMS agency basically oversees the uh, Sacramento County. So we oversee all the providers and I oversee the, uh, the programs that teach EMT and paramedic, making sure that they follow regulations and our policies basically. Um, and I assist wherever I can, of course, if they want me to come in and, and talk about anything, I'm always happy to do that. So our primary job here again is just oversight. We don't uh, hire, we just educate. So as the providers like such as Alpha One, when they hire um, a paramedic, they come into our um, conference room, our office, and we put them through an orientation to orient them to the county uniqueness of the county and some of our policies and, and protocols. And then we accredit them so that they are able to work in the county with those providers. Uh, currently we have, I think, nine uh, private ambulance company that work in the Sacramento area and we have four public. We also have some non-transporting um, advanced life support uh, fire departments and the airport and then we have some um, helicopters too. Um, what else? Well, I think that's a really good overview, Kim, because it, it shows um, a different way of, first of all, the kind of things that are required in the field, the, the policies and the accreditation process. A lot of occupations in the health industry do need accreditation. So that's an important element. And just kind of the overview, I know we can talk later about some of what you see in the trends and um, given that you have a different view of different dynamics in the field. So that's great. Thanks, Kathy. And then Kim, how about you and your overview, please? Hello, thanks for having me here. Uh, Kim Inucci, Assistant Chief of Sacramento Fire. I um, actually oversee our outreach and recruitment division. Um, and uh, that includes managing several pipeline programs. Um, and working to get all these EMTs and paramedics that you train hired. Um, and uh, as far as um, services that, that Sacramento Fire Department provides, um, we, uh, we have 24 fire stations, 24 engines, um, 10 truck or hazmat units, and 17 um, advanced life support um, units in our, in our system. Um, to, to manage and run that whole program requires about 350 firefighters that are either EMTs or paramedics. Um, we like to lean um, a little higher on the paramedics um, as far as our numbers. Ideally, we'd have 75% paramedics and 25% EMTs. So um, just as a, a quick broad spectrum, um, our paramedics, our, our medics also work as firefighters, they, um, they have two teams. They do part-time on a medic and part-time on a, a suppression unit. So um, they're multi-rolled. Multi Thank you so much, uh, Kim. I think a lot of us from outside the field are learning a lot today about the, the way the system works and the various aspects of what you all cover. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. So for the next level of uh, question, I, I want to ask you what you thought about the information that Ebony presented. And as you can tell, we try to frame our conversations around data, but it's a kind of an iterative process and we all learn from each other. So in terms of the labor market data, did anything surprise you or was it different than what you expected? Matt, I'll start with you on that question. Yeah, nothing was really terribly surprising. Um, the, ex the, the challenge that we found when we are recruiting is educating a new hire or anybody who's currently working as uh, like the wage structure of hourly versus the annual income. And I don't know if there's any data out there that you guys would have access to to collect, but um, I think that is one of the things that I did have a question for Ebony, and I didn't get a chance to put it out there, is the perception of value um, that a lot of the uh, individuals have on the hourly wage earning versus doing the actual math of the annual income that they, um, that they pull in. And it's easy to put a number on, you know, the hourly earning, but 
I think the more experienced individual would actually do the math and realize that a lot of the wages that are actually out there are pretty comparable to public versus private in some aspects, but um, there's just a, a big focus on that hourly wage, which in EMS, um, there's a lot of overtime associated with, you know, the system 24 hour shifts and 12 hour shifts and things of that sort. So that would be the one thing I would say maybe would be, um, was so it's surprising that I found uh, mm -hmm. in recruitment and um, education and then trying to, you know, educate those that come into the industry that there's a difference between an yeah. eight hour workday versus a 24 versus a 12 hour workday. But outside so, of that, nothing terribly so, surprising. Great, thank you, Matt. So are you saying too that if you, if people saw more what an annual wage was that incorporated kind of overtime and other things that that would make be a more accurate representation of compensation, but also would that help re with recruitment? It would, yeah, I, I really think it would um, for us specifically. And I, it's, it's a, I think it's a private sector difference versus a public sector difference. Cause I know a lot of the public sector advertisements for um, job, job announcements include the salary, which is a monthly or an annual, mm -hmm. but for some reason, um, the private sector, and this is, you know, I'm not sure where it came from, but it's just one of those particular nuances where I found that there's a difference um, in mm -hmm. hourly versus annual perception. Well, good to note. And we'll, um, I know that Ebony's listening, so we'll, she'll be able to follow up with you on that, Matt. Thank you. Um, Kathy, how about you? This, anything that surprised you about the data or... Um, validate or just nuances that you maybe saw? No, nothing surprised me. Um, I will echo what Matt Burrell said about the annual wages versus uh, hourly wages. Um, because when I worked the field, I was on a private ambulance in Contra Costa County. And uh, if you compared the what you made hourly to what versus annually, it would come out a lot more because of the overtime and because of the 24 hour shifts. And that's what I work 24, 48, 96 mm. hour shifts also. So once you click in over into that overtime, you're, you're making a lot more money than what you mm. technically do hourly. So I would probably echo that if you guys could do that kind of, you know, put some numbers around that. I think you probably have a better, better chance with hiring also with privates. Mm. It also seems to be something that's important for people to understand when they come into this field is that it's not a nine to five job. There, It's a different um, work structure and there are opportunities for more compensation, but you, know, you have to be okay with being in a field with those extended hours and things like that. So I imagine people figure that out pretty quickly, but still. Well, and that's, uh, this is Kathy, I'm sorry. That's one of the, the uh, the harder part, I mean, it's not really hard because when you when you come into the field as a medic or an EMT uh, or even as a firefighter, EMT, paramedic, you go in understanding because the schools do teach you. You could be mm -hmm. working at 12, 8, 12, 16, or even a 24 or 48 hour shift. It, where it really comes into an interesting fact is with the um, spouses or the mm -hmm. significant others. Mm -hmm. They have a the learning curve is around them and not understanding that our hours fluctuate. Yes, I'm working a 12 hour shift, but unfortunately we got a late call. So yeah. I will not be home for another three hours possibly. And that's where it gets, that's where it really starts getting hard because they don't always anticipate that aspect of it. Thank you, Kathy. One of the things we wanna provide for the faculty too is um, that knowledge base too, because it's kind of what are the broader things you need to do to prepare students for what the life is going to look like in this profession so that they have a holistic view of those kind of issues and the supports that could be provided through that. Thank you. Uh, how about you, Kim? What's your perspective on the information that Ebony provided? Um, it didn't really surprise me, except that I did, I was surprised at the hourly rate. Um, and I'm just gonna echo what Kathy and Matt are saying because I'm always um, pointing young uh, future candidates to work for privates. And oftentimes they think that the um, wages 
aren't that good. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I, I'll explain, look, that you're, it's not, you're working overtime hours and it's just mm -hmm. not factored in. Our wages are factored in. We're factored in as a 56 hour work week and FSLA and all that is, is included into it. And so you're not really comparing apples to oranges in the wage mm. scales. Oh, that's so, interesting. Um, yeah, and we, you know, and, and the privates know this, many many start there because they, they want the experience, the field experience so that they can become firefighters. And, you know, it's, it, oh. and there's many that want to stay there as careers. And, you know, either way, Privates is where most um, most young EMT and paramedics get started. That's interesting. Great, thank you very much. Um, now, next question is, uh, what are your key demand, in-demand occupations and skills? One of the things we're trying to understand is what positions you have the most difficulty hiring for and um, can the colleges of the education system and the providers help provide those um, uh, pathways to those particular occupations and skills. Now, Ebony's data mentioned that there's a pretty short hiring time of 33 days. So it sounds like um, from what people have said too, there's maybe there isn't so much of a challenge on that, but we really want to try to understand that a little bit better. So Matt, what's your perspective on um, your ability to hire people that you need with the right skills? Well, it's the the challenge with that is um, it's not really the skill set; it's matching the culture, and that's that's hard to teach. So, um, you, generally, when somebody, I, I think the schools in general do a really really good job of preparing the students for, you know, protocol acknowledgement, the um, you know, innovations, IV start, and you know, assessment skills and how to think of things. The the tricky part is getting an individual that knows how to do all those things, but also knows how to be nice. And it's, we call it a, a customer service and a patient care balance. And um, so that, that's, that's one component. Uh, but the other component is, um, I think the bottleneck is internships at this point mm -hmm. and allowing people to get on the ambulance and finish their ride-alongs and finish their patient contact times and then actually get in the field. Um, you know, it takes probably about 30 days after they're done with all three phases to get their um, state card, national registry testing process done and things like that. So it is quick when they finish, but I know I know it's, it's um, and this has been for quite some time, is finding quality mentors to mentor these students to where they could have a successful pathway towards the career that they're choosing. So um, for us, I know we're, we're a preceptor company and I'm specifically involved in that. And that's something that I, I do appreciate uh, partnering up with American River College on that. And, um, and I've told Dr. Gould this about his um, teaching process on just understanding the components of visual and kinesthetic learning and things of that sort. And then to empower the preceptors and teach them what that word actually means to get these students um, in the door and provide a mentor for them versus somebody who's looking down at them. It's almost like a peer level mm -hmm. uh, concept. So mm -hmm. that's one challenge is finding good preceptors and good mentors to get these individuals, um, you know, through and start their pathway. And then also, um, you know, for us, like I said, we love having new people. I just don't know how other agencies treat brand new paramedics that are struggling in the skills and things like that, but realize the personality is also a value too that you can't, you can't teach. So it's, a, right. it's multifaceted, but. And you were mentioning that finding quality mentors, was, it sounds like that was a challenge beforehand, maybe exacerbated, especially finding locations where people can work on site, but the, the other aspect of finding the good mentoring is something that preceded COVID. It is, and I think um, COVID's limiting the the number of um, opportunities for students mm -hmm. currently. Yeah. yeah, it's a big challenge for any occupation that needs on-site kind of exposure and real-world experience. 
Okay, thank you very much, Matt. How about you, Kathy, from your lens, your overview lens, what do you see um, as some of those maybe job skills mismatches or positions where people in the field might be having some challenges to hire or find the right skill sets? I think the challenges right now in the field is, um, is taking the students from the schools into their internships because we do have a bottleneck up right now because for uh, at least three to four months, we had it to where they could not ride along because of the, the virus. Um, yeah. So they kind of halted all that. And now we've got this PPE, the personal protective equipment, mm -hmm. that is a little bit of a shortage. And so the students have to either come with their own or the provider has to have enough to go around because we have to protect those students that are going into this environment mm -hmm. because they're going home to possibly their extended family. Yeah. And they have to be careful with that. I think that's where the real challenge is right now. Before the virus, Matt was absolutely right. You had the issues of trying to find enough preceptors uh, to do the job because a, a lot of times it's not, the mentorship is it sometimes comes in secondary to what am I being compensated to do this? And as much as I hate to say that, but that yeah. is the way it was when I was in the field. When I was in the field, you didn't get compensated very much. So you you had to have wanted to make an impact on the system and help bring that next generation of paramedics into the into the realm and, and teach them to be good medics. Um, and that's the reason why I did it. And I think the number one thing I always told them from day one is not only am I your preceptor, yes, and I'm a mentor, but you are my partner in this. So together, we're, we're going to learn from each other moving forward. And I think, as Matt said, I think that's a very hard thing to teach. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it is life experience. I got into mm -hmm. the field a lot later than a lot of other people. They're coming in to the field at the age of 18, and I came into it at the age of 32. Um, so yeah. I had a whole lot of life experience to bring with mm -hmm. me that I could, you know, put onto uh, the students that I was teaching. So. Uh, yeah, well, I think this is something we've seen in other areas, too. Um, first of all, when you do these preceptor mentorships, it has to be a good experience for the student, but also for the person doing that. And how do you build that into the somebody's job description, too? Because it does take time to be able to do that well. Um, so, and it's an important part of preparing people to work in the field. Uh, it's real, that's really coming through here. So thank you, Kathy, for that insight. How about you, Kim? What's your perspective? You do a lot of work. You mentioned, I you know we talked about with pathways and with high schools. So from your um, angle on both sides of working with the students and in the, in the fire department, how do you see that match happening? So um, we, uh, paramedics are harder. It's a smaller pool of paramedics. Um, and um, typically, you know, we hire 30 to 50, depending on retirements a year of uh, firefighters and they're either firefighter paramedic or firefighter EMTs. We've been hiring half and half. And um, typically our, our uh, hiring pool is um, much higher with EMTs than it is with paramedics. Additionally, the issue um, is the paramedic pool tends to be less diverse. And um, that's something that city of Sacramento um, cares a lot about. Uh, mm -hmm. So as you know, to answer that, we have the pathway programs for schools within our community because you know, we, we hope to hire directly from our community. Um, I talk about it a little later on the skills required, but I'm, I'm, I'll just bring it up right now. Okay. Um, what is like, so kids that are um, in healthway profession pathways, mm -hmm. I think do great going going straight into EMT school out of out of high school because they're familiar with the terminology. They know, you know, uh, they they have been um, exposed to a number of um, these you know uh, these techniques and skills that that will make them successful in EMT school. Um, where we're concerned are is with the students that are in the uh, public safety pathways like fire technology. Um, and so what we're doing, and I noticed Chris Hubbard's on uh, is one of the um, attendees in this 
in this um, room is he's worked with Valley High. Uh, he works at, at Kasumnas and they've created a PMED 109 class for those kids. Anybody can join it, but kids just getting out of, of um, high school as kind of like a, a, a bridge class before they start EMT. And I think it would be a great advisory class to have at all the colleges that offer EMT um, for those who are just getting into this whole new world of, um, you know, the terminology and the skills that are probably completely different from any of their high school coursework they've been doing in the past. And I think even adults coming back into it, it's a good, it's a good advisory class to take. You know, I don't know if you want to make it a prerequisite, but I think mm -hmm. it's a good advisory class ahead of time. Um, so, so yeah. Go ahead, sorry, Kim. Yeah. No, paramedics are uh, what we need most of. Um, and, uh, you know, getting, getting our, uh, and, and we don't hire until 21. So getting mm -hmm. our, our young kids um, through EMT and then on to paramedic school is where we try to get them. And so then of mm -hmm. course they have to have the experience um, to be accepted into ARC's program because that's, you know, that's our partnership is with American River College. So. Thank you, Kim. And we'll ask, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more further on. But I did want to note what you said too about hiring work from the community. And I know Julie wants to reference that the, the issue of diversity and some of the numbers that Ebony showed about the demographics kind of reflect the, the need to maybe be broader in terms of um, the labor market and the people going into the field. So the the work that you're doing really is building that future workforce too that does reflect the community more. So it's mm -hmm. Very important, so thank you. So the next question is, um, I think we've had some conversation about this, but maybe just uh, at stage set by Dr. Maynard, but maybe if you could just give a quick summary of what you see as the types of skills that are really emerging as a critical need as a result of not only COVID, but we're also looking at the changes in technology, automation, data analytics, things like that, about how, and you know, it's um, reflecting the practice. And I know from some personal experience, um, you know, that you can do things like do heart monitors, right? You know, in the hall or something like that with your EMT or paramedic. So, um, so interested to see how the field is adapting for those kind of um, changes that we've seen accelerated by COVID. And, you know, we're trying to see how the, you create the pathway of people that have more of the digital or, or uh, technology skills. So Matt, I'll start with you on that question, please. Sure, yeah, the, um, I think, before COVID, we were going down a digital pathway um, anyways. And when I was in the field, it was it was really nice because we could do paper PCRs and it was, you know, 10 minutes and not a problem. Um, but nowadays with electronic PCR uh, reporting and also the um, advances in EKG monitors and things of that sort, um, there's been a a big push on technological advancement in EMS in general. And a lot of that has to do uh, with, you know, requirements of data capturing mm -hmm. and then, you know, monitoring patient trends um, based on whichever region we're in. And then, you know, helping whatever county or state entities, you know, identify what treatment standards and protocols and policies may need to change or be updated or implemented. So I think it's a, it's a value, but it is, a relevant um, factor nowadays where you take, you know, somebody who started before the 12 lead was even um, authorized in the field and throw them into the world now, I think they would be pretty, pretty lost. Um, so there is, a, there is a significance in that um, technological advance. And I think it's a, the big emphasis from an educational standpoint would be um, letting the medic students and ENTs know that they're their behaviors and their uh, reporting and tracking is actually extremely relevant in the continuum of care down the line. Mm. And a lot of individuals don't realize that when they do the 12 lead and they do a, a medication or treatment mm -hmm. that that cardiologist is gonna look at their pre and post treatment strategies that EKG and then compare when they admit to the hospital and then when they you know, have their treatment and then their cath lab results 
but it's a full picture and a full story where a lot of times we do those treatment strategies and we enter all the data in and push all the buttons and then we never see it again. But mm -hmm. really emphasizing that it's a critical component of finding out where the patient was and then where the patient's going when they hit the ER mm -hmm. and then when the continuation of care after the fact. So, mm -hmm. and that's all by technology um, that we can easily pull it by clicking a few buttons and pulling the data and then looking at trends. So from an educational um, quality improvement status or uh, quality improvement process mm -hmm. it's we're moving the dial on it pretty well and rapidly way more rapidly than than we were on paper by, by far thank you matt and so a lot of the technology i think is in the um the the trucks of the ambulances or whatever or when you get to a hospital or a facility and the equipment is administered right so I think so one question we've had in some other areas is is there a challenge with um, students having exposure to equipment that's part of it. it seems like that's part of the on the ground experience is that you not only see it but you maybe use it or you begin to understand the application of it is that the case I think it depends on the age of the individual right so if we have a a 25 year old or 22 year old coming in they pick up on it really quick and we just hired somebody i think that's around 35 or so and they're it's it's a it's a learning curve because they're you know coming from a blue collar background and you know doing hands hands-on work and things of that sort and then now we put them in front of a computer um, and it's it's not the same it's a little bit different mm -hmm. and it's the technology the technology advance is good but the downside to it is it takes away from that personal interaction with the patient mm -hmm. because there's this thing looming. It's almost like going out to a dinner date and leaving your cell phone on top of the table mm -hmm. and you're constantly looking at it. You're not engaging mm -hmm. with that individual by making eye contact or, you know, things of that sort. So mm -hmm. it, it has its pluses and minuses. Okay. Yeah. And then I think, you're dealing with patients sometimes who are in stress too. So you do have the other side of the human element of the patient care you mentioned. Um, okay, thank you, Matt. Kathy, what what do you think about that? The the types of skills emerging, we heard a lot from Dr. Maynard as we mentioned, but the in that continuum also just the impact of technology on the field. Um, well, data drives medicine and, uh, and, and where medicine goes is based on the data that we we can pull from those patient care reports. You know, like Matt was saying, um, they have to push so many different buttons and it's always changing. The state mandates change and then it trickles down to the local EMS agencies. And then we have to um, trickle it down to our providers who have to make all these changes on the back end of a computer to make it work. And then you have to teach the fill how mm -hmm. to um, push those right buttons and make it a mandatory field so that they can't go any further in their PCR or transmit it without those fields being done. And a lot of times, unfortunately, with paramedics and EMTs, it's, it is daunting um, because you get into the field to, to save lives, you know, mm -hmm. to make a difference, to have that patient contact. And a lot of times when you're sitting there trying to do a, a PCR and you're like, well, I didn't sign up for this, you know, they don't, mm -hmm. if they're not understanding why, the whys, why we have to put that information in and why we have to capture it, if they don't understand the whys, then they're not fully invested. So I think that the challenges are that we're seeing now, we're really trying to implement here in Sacramento County, is that the feedback. They need the feedback to know if what the procedure they did and document it actually made a change and in that patient's care, whether it's immediate, whether it's two days or a month down the line, did it make an impact on that patient? And if they can get that feedback, then, they, then they're invested. They're like, okay, now I get it. This is why I'm entering all this data because they're mm -hmm. gonna pull that data and we're gonna make changes. Yeah, sure, a lot of moving pieces. There is. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. How about you, Kim, from your perspective, uh, especially what's going on in the 
in the firehouse and depart the stations and on all the trucks and the vehicles. Okay. I, I love the technology reminding me of what I'm doing here. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, are you on mute? Cause I can't see. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, you know, we, we have uh, pretty simplistic devices that we, we bought from um, Harbor Freight that we, um, we spray the stations down, we spray the medics down, you know, all that decon stuff. Um, but what I wanna say about um, how COVID has affected us is, you know, it's kind of, has it changed um, our skill sets? It's kind of a yes and no answer. Um, we know about infectious disease protocols and what we're supposed to be doing. I think what has happened is we've become better infectious disease uh, practitioners and using the precautions that have been recommended forever um, and um, being a little more hyper alert around that. And, um, and so that's, you know, that's what's, what's changed as a result of COVID. Um, another thing is actually COVID has opened doors um, to um, deli uh, service delivery models. Uh, we have a uh, COVID testing unit put in place. Uh, Metro has one and so does Kasumas Fire, um, where our, we have a couple of trained, or we have a, a handful of trained personnel that staff a, a medic unit, um, uh, eight or 10 hours a day, and they go to some of the nursing care facilities, some of the assisted living facilities, um, high-risk facilities that don't necessarily have transportation to get to a testing facility. And we're testing, we're working with the county and, and um, doing that. So, you know, that's different. Um, and what it also opens up the door to is um, the conversation around mobile integrated health. We've been, you know, trying to get to this to um, a, a service model that um, can help relieve this really impacted um, ALS system that we have, this 911 response system within the county, um, to have some uh, community, some some community uh, behavioral health unit response units that have a mental health professional with an EMT, so that mm -hmm. we get people to the appropriate uh, resources that they need. Um, rather than dumping them off in a emergency room. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second is a um, called the community care response unit, would, which would have a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant with um, a paramedic. And we could actually be doing low, you know, low level prescriptions. Um, some of those calls that we get called out for that don't really require people going to an emergency room mm -hmm. and, um, and impacting, the, the, impacting the, medic, the emergency rooms mm -hmm. with a level of care that's probably the most expensive level of care out there. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, it, and, and it's creating opportunities for that. The hospitals are very engaged and, and interested. Um, but, you know, we're starting with the COVID testing units. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as technology, um, we, you know, we've been doing EPCRs for a while. Um, the level of technology out there is just phenomenal. You've got monitors that can that can transmit directly to ERs. Um, in general, I'd have to say that um, companies like Alpha One and the colleges, you're doing the you're doing great training because we're getting we're getting. Um, uh, candidates that are that are handling the um, technology fairly well, so um, we're you know we're not having real huge problems in that area. And I I didn't know for certain, but I did check to see where we were at. Um, and it's like what Kathy stated: it's putting it's making the EPCR firefighter proof so that they don't go any further if they forget to put something in, um, and making sure and, and you know that the communication is going out on why it's important. Um, and you know where we need, where, why we need this information, and mm -hmm. down the road you could be subpoenaed on a call um, for you know why you entered in information this way or didn't enter in information. So it's really important, and you know kudos to the colleges, kudos to the private companies that are um, that are doing a good job on getting um, getting this this training out there. Oh, 
you know, that's such a great uh, oversight, uh, Kim, about how COVID is spurring innovation, or maybe it's accelerating practices that you wanted to implement, like the mobile health units. And I, I just want to note that uh, in December, working with Julie's um, lead and with uh, the Center of Excellence, there's going to be a new workforce assessment report out about behavioral health. And so that'll be an opportunity, I think, for us to come together and continue this conversation because, uh, you know, how we can also reduce the load on things like emergency rooms, like you're saying, opportunities for partnerships with, say, the fire department and other aspects of the health profession and um, making, it, reaching out to communities that are having trouble intersecting with the, the, the system for the better service of, and continuum of care. So really, um, really good to hear about that and that technology, it will keep accelerating and changing, but it seems like people are preparing and keeping up with that pretty well. So um, one, Fish, I'm gonna- um, Yes. I just wanted to say we have a question in the oh. chat uh, asking oh. the panelists if they can speak to how to best prepare students for anticipating care for individuals with mental health needs. Mm -hmm. I believe yeah. Julie has put this forth. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, thank you, er Renee. So that would be part of the behavioral health side and mental health is a huge issue in the community and especially again with the impact of COVID on people's well-being. So would anybody like to um, take a pass at answering this question. Uh, how best to prepare students for anticipating care for individuals with mental health needs where, while they're out in the community? Uh, I'll take a stab and I'm sure, I'm sure Matt has some answers as well. Um, we do talk with our uh, recruits about um, about the industry and the, and, you know, the um, resources available um, I, I talk about this a little deeper in when you asked about um, how, how to better prepare college students, but we're already there. So okay. um, there should be a section in their training about behavioral health, um, and, and it should be more than a two-hour class. Um, and, and, mm -hmm. and, it's, it's a, um, and it's not only for the community and, you know, some of the... Um, some of their contacts that they're going to be with, but it's also for themselves and how to manage yeah. the type of calls, um, the trauma that they're going to see, mm -hmm. the abuse they're going to see, the um, just you know the kind of calls, the repeated calls, and and um, there's 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 compassion fatigue that happens, and mm -hmm. so behavioral health is huge. Um, there's there's a high percentage, a higher percentage than the national average on um, suicide in EMTs, in the privates, and in uh, firefighters in, you know, in, in general, um, high, you know, a higher rate nationwide. So it, it's an important mm -hmm. component that needs to be part of the initial training so that they're aware. And then mm -hmm. individual um, employers, it's incumbent on them that they follow and continue that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kim. And we've had discussions with some other areas like you may know about in the restaurant industry. It's a high stress industry that's had a lot of um, challenges with suicide. And so they've developed some programs to provide peer support among other things. So we've been talking about how to um, bring that into other fields of practice and um, you know really help not only prepare students, but support students and, and workers in the industry. So that's something we definitely want to follow up on. We're getting kind of a little over the time, but before we close, I want to ask, I'll fold the last two questions in. What's your experience of partnering with the community colleges? You've all mentioned things, but just to recap that, and then suggestions for how the colleges can better prepare students for jobs in the industry, including any specific courses, et cetera. Now you've mentioned a few things, so if there's anything else you would like to add, that would be great. And then um, we'll go to Dr. Gould. So Matt, um, how about you? Yeah, with um, with partnering, uh, it's, it's a great relationship that I think fosters the pathway that I think everybody on this, um, 
on this group understands and uh, without relationships then um, the students don't really have an advantage for placement or career paths so and we I'm pr we're pretty transparent when we have students come in um, and I'm transparent with our employees too that I mean treat it as a working interview and if they come in with that mentality and they're you know professional and and um, you know fit the fit the um, EMS model then we can correct them before they even hit the interview and and it's if anything they're they're um, shopping agencies because I know every school has multiple contracts and they're trying to fit into the culture so um, that's the big thing and then as far as uh, suggestions uh, just to springboard off what Kim was talking about with mental health it's big to have the empathy towards the patients we're going to um, encounter but a lot of it is um, helping students understand that the PTSD process or that um, mental health for themselves personally generally isn't one event. It's, mm -hmm. it's usually ordinary people put in, in multiple extraordinary circumstances that kind mm -hmm. of builds to a point. And then teaching those um, individuals that a healthy mind goes away from pain and seeks pleasure. And that's okay, but really um, teaching them how that process can become destructive in their personal lives. Mm -hmm. And then also to have empathy for those that they're dealing with to people that, um, that we're gonna treat that didn't have that coaching per se. And then now they've hit rock bottom and now they're in the back of our ambulance. And mm -hmm. how do we assist managing that? So mm -hmm. those, are, those are the two things I would say is um, empathy towards those we serve and fellow colleagues and ourselves. Thank you, Matt. That's really beautiful. Appreciate that. Uh, how about you, Kathy? I think um, the one thing I would emphasize is peer support uh, with all uh, walks of life, all agencies, whether they're private or public, there needs to be uh, peer support because a lot of times we'll talk to our peers before we'll reach out to a professional. Um, and those peers need to be trained on how to handle and where to direct um, their fellow um, brothers and sisters on where to go if they need additional help. Post-traumatic is, is one of the biggest things. And um, what we learn in the field is to uh, squash it because you've got to run to the next call. Um, and you squash it for so long that when you uh, leave the field, those uh, doors start opening up in your mind. I'm one of those people um, because you didn't have time to think about it when you were there, but now there's some feedback in. Um, I would also, uh, I was lucky when I went through paramedic school, we actually had a module that went the entire course of our um, schooling. So every class we had a couple hours dedicated to mental health. We had an instructor come in that was a mental health expert and he would teach us how to handle those uh, cases. So I was, I thought I was pretty well prepared and it's what I taught my students Saving a life does not mean just you brought them back from um, an overdose or you made their heart beat again. It's, it's your words that you could make a difference in somebody's life that has tried to commit suicide or is threatening suicide from your words and your empathy. So that, That's just powerful. Thank you very much, Kathy. And Kim, we'll close with you uh, and your insights. Uh, I couldn't agree more with Kathy. Um, having that, again, you know, mental health preparation training, um, but then following up, with, you know, in their school coursework, you know, a lot of time spent on that and the patients that they're going to be working with um, that may be in crisis, as well as how best to manage, being fully aware that this is the kind of work you're getting into mm -hmm. and these are the practices you be, should be starting right now today. Um, you know, as far as um, your health, um, being, you know, physically fit, uh, eating well, sleeping well, meditation, whatever, whatever um, coping skills that you can learn that are healthier uh, than self-medicating. Um, and then, of course, it's on us to make sure we have good peer support units um, and, and EAP programs that we can make sure that we take care of our employees. Um, as far as... Um, our partnerships, we have a great partnership with American River College. Uh, we get their paramedics, we get their um, 
their EMT students. Uh, we were closed down for a while. I know we've got the medics coming in, the paramedics, and um, where we've opened up again for EMTs. So um, that allows the, the patient contacts that are vital to these programs um, and the partnerships. And, and uh, Dr. Gould has always been great with our student placements in our, um, our fire reserve program in um, assisting them um, in getting into the, the program courses. Um, as far as getting back to my concern about hiring from the community and um, so that we better represent the community. Um, you know, I'd like to see what demographic, if demographics are tracked to dis determine um, success for completion or failure. Do we know what students are not um, getting, um, what was the word you guys use, the, cer the, the, the cert certificate? Um, who's, who's successfully passing and who is falling out of the programs? Are there certain demographics that that's more that are more affected, um, and is it reviewed and are um, processes put in place to um, help help with um, those particular um, needs that may be addressed? Um, and then um, me personally, because I deal with young young kids, um, I would love to see. Um, I would love more information on tuition grants, et cetera, what is actually, um, what, what can actually pay for their EMT or their paramedic school because it's outside the normal um, college tuition costs. And um, I don't fully, you know, know every little, um, how, what, what their, um, their grants or whatever student financial aid they receive, what can be applied towards these courses. Additionally, my cadets that just finished, um, graduated from high school and were matriculating into college, they, they called me constantly with help on how to sign up for the classes they need and get the books oh, wow. they needed. Mm -hmm. So I need some more training or I need a better place to point these young kids to. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I literally got online with them and, and helped them navigate through the, through the program, um, explain to them about um, GE requirements and what that means and, and what part of the program, they, uh, the catalog they needed to look at. And, and um, so, you know, they, some of these kids are at-risk kids um, and they don't have parents that have even gone to college before. Mm -hmm. So I need some better training in, in that area. Well, back to that support word, and um, and that's a great call to action. And it's just been such a rich conversation. I'm sorry we can't be in the room together to clap and share. Uh, um, Julie says thank you to the panel for your expertise, guidance, and industry input, which have been very valuable. I echo that. Um, really want to thank you for all the incredible work that you do for the community and for our students. So. We'll be continuing the conversation and um, I'm clapping and cheering you all. So thank you so much. Um, and now we're gonna hear from Dr. Gold. So it's a great segue into what you've been mentioning about your partnership with him. So thank you again. Uh, thank you, Trish. I just wanted to first say it's not, not a partnership with me. It's a partnership with the college and we would be nowhere if we didn't have members of this panelist, panel team that were so supportive of all that we try to do. Uh, we're not perfect in any way, shape or form, but our team is very focused. And when I say our team, I'm talking about all the people that are attending today as well. Every single one of these people plays such a critical role in the success of our students. And, and we, we stay very uh, focused on our student population, but if it wasn't for the folks like like the panelists today, we would be in big trouble. We just simply would not have the kind of successes that we have. Uh, I wanted to answer Kim's question very quickly. We look very much forward to having our our industry partners on our campuses so that we can help them understand an ever-changing uh, landscape when it comes to student support services. The colleges are intensely focused on our disadvantaged youth or disadvantaged students and those that are disproportionately impacted. So we love those engagements and those partnerships. And I, I think I can speak for all my colleagues at the colleges that we really want to have our industry partners understand completely all of the things that we are doing to diversify our population, to bring additional supports to those teams, so on and so forth. So 
uh, it's just uh, an email. I know we're all sick of emails. I know I am. Uh, but if it's a phone call or, you know, it's whatever, we would love to share those efforts together and jointly. And there's some really bright people on this, uh, on the, in the attendees group that do a wonderful job of making that happen. I wanted to just very briefly, and I'm gonna play catch up real quick. I wanted to just shift gears very quickly and talk specifically to the EMS faculty that are on this phone call and their support supervisors. In a time like we're suffering right now, oftentimes we get very focused on our students and that's, that's a good thing to do. But unfortunately, the science tells us it comes at a cost. And a lot of that cost is an avoidance of self-care. Kathy kind of touched on this a little bit in her comments, but us EMS faculty, we know, and, and, and I will tell you every one of them that's on the call today, uh, spend an inordinate amount of time focused on our student success. And that's a good thing, but it comes at a cost. So I just wanna challenge all of us to constantly consider self-care and doing what we need to do to take care of ourselves because you're for if you're an angry old EMS educator that's going to trickle over into the people that that Kim and, and Matt hire and that's not a good thing and so I want to just suggest that we take time and we step back and we ask ourselves what am I doing to improve myself as a master teacher some of you may know that I'm a big proponent of a program called AQ it is a two semester course that the colleges have been very supportive. Kim and, and, and others on this phone call today have been very supportive uh, of really helping faculty get the necessary tools to improve the quality of their instruction. And, and I think it's important that we take time out of our day-to-day -day grind to step back and ask that question. And so I would just encourage you that if, if you would like to improve the quality of your instruction, regardless how many hours or years or, or what have you that you've been teaching, take a look at what are some of the, the courses that I can do from a professional development standpoint. That's super important to do, particularly as we migrate a lot of our courses to an online work experience. None of us, I think, really went through our college preparation thinking what's the pedagogy that's important for online education. Uh, and then one final thing, I'm working with, uh, with the state folks to try to bring into our region um, virtual reality as an augmented uh, tool to use for um, learning and critical thinking as students prepare for potentially field internships, but as, as, a, as an augmentation. And I need about 20 EMT and paramedic schools to join ranks with me so that we can get what Julie tried to do here locally, try to get a statewide um, activity together so that we can educate about a thousand students in the pilot on how to integrate virtual reality into their learning. You know, a lot of our students are very, very young and virtual reality is what they've done since almost birth. And so virtual reality may be scary to us, but it's certainly not to many of our students. So if you're interested, uh, send me an email and I'll put you on the list of folks in, in about 10 minutes. We're gonna join on a statewide call to talk about virtual reality. So those are the two things that I wanted to just say, take care of ourselves, look for those opportunities for professional development. Uh, great team at Folsom College is, is she's, Vicki's doing a great job of supporting that. Kim I know has in the past uh, and continues to do that, but we're really uh, at that forefront of that. So uh, Trish, that ends what I wanted to say to the group, but thank you everyone for your time today. It's been fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Gould, for joining us. I think you're being modest. And um, I did want to note what you mentioned about virtual reality. In these convenings that we're doing for the various community college sectors, another one is information and communication technology, which we've kind of looked at across Nexus with health IT, health information technology, but the virtual reality is another important one that might be really great to explore um, as in future meetings. So thank you so much again for all of your help and, and your leadership. I'm going to turn it over to Julie now. She's going to give a quick overview of the programs that we have um, in, the, in the field. And, um, and Julie will comment too on some insights from Dr. Gould's presentation. So thank you. Thank you very much, Trish, and thank you, Dr. Gould. That was um, great information, always advocating for our faculty and um, transitioning. Everybody's been pivoting with online education. How do we best do that? I think we are doing an amazing job uh, very quickly in these last six months. 
but it now it's time to really kind of think about our next steps and how to get that pedagogy down so that we can really um, inspire students. And that kind of loops back to some of maybe some of the next steps that I was gleaning from our industry partners, which we're so grateful that you were all here, Kim and Matt and Kathy. Um, you guys were amazing information for us to understand what is going on in industry and how we can help our students and our programs strengthen and pivot uh, to really meet that workforce need. And I really, uh, some of the things that were takeaways for me that perhaps might be some next steps, uh, whether that be if we would like to meet again as a large group um, or whether we'd like to do smaller focus groups, that would be an opportunity perhaps. But uh, looking at that mentorship role and that preceptor role, and sometimes helping students in college understand that that could be a trajectory if they naturally uh, gravitate toward helping their peers in school, they often will go on to be a peer and a mentor within practice. So those are some things that kind of uh, that came forth and that does accept really extend on to the pipeline support. Um, and that also goes into the peer support because taking care of the caregiver um, is really, really important with compassion fatigue and literally serious burnout. And as um, Kim shared as well with uh, looking at some of the mental health risk that takes place with, uh, with EMT and paramedics. So I felt like those were very strong themes today. Um, I think continuum of care, really thinking about how technology and documentation right in the field and transitioning to the facility, um, how important that is and what's that feedback. I think that, that is, that's a golden ticket when you think about, hey, my documentation on that EKG before I gave X medicine, you know, really did help the outcome for the patient with their care. Um, so sometimes we don't get that information when you are transitioning for a brief time with patients. And then at the same time, we're asking for our first responders to really be uh, connecting with patients with the high incidences of, um, you know, mental disorders right now that are happening in our community. So it's a lot to be asking, uh, but all of us are really trying to strive to how do we get that content delivered to students and make them be safe and really love their job and stay in their job for a long time and be um, a compassionate uh, team player um, and understanding the culture of how we service our communities. And so my hat just reaches out to everybody in the, in the, in the panels and um, the, all the educators that were able to join us today. And if there's any information they would like to share in the chat, that would be great for next steps for you and your college or your faculty. Um, please uh, add that in the chat as something that might be important to you for next steps. And I thought we could also, Trish, if you wanted to, um, I want to thank again Valley Vision as well, um, very much of a great partner. And again, the North Far North and Los Rios for supporting this event and to the whole team um, that, that was able to pull this off and, uh, and to hopefully get shared excellent information. And I know that we're talking about, maybe Trish, you wanna um, wrap up and maybe do talk about uh, the next possibility for us. You mentioned about the behavioral health. Yes, thank you so much, Julie. And I just wanna thank again, our team, first of all, Renee and Jesse and Emma for helping everything runs smoothly and all the planning that's gone into this. And um, again, thank our speakers and also just Julie, it's fantastic working with you. And uh, we've just learned a lot and also the issues that, that are getting raised and the care that you all exhibit to the community and the students uh, and the employers is, is really inspiring. So we wanna continue to support that process through the community college uh, regional advisory process. We do spring and fall meetings for each sector. It's a little bit um, challenging in the health sector because there's so many different occupations and the spring meeting is going to focus in part on gerontology, but I think we heard some actual um, good linkages today with the ways that you support that um, segment of the population through your services. 
but also on December 10th, we'll be supporting Julie and the Center of Excellence to uh, roll out a new report. So we'll, we'll keep you on the information list and we will also be summarizing the meeting notes, making sure you get all the information about who was uh, participating today, Ebony's presentation, and the list of programs that Julie provided. And I know we'll be working with everyone to make sure Ebony has the, the information. And one of the things that's important about the list that Julie did is that we wanna have good materials, not only for the faculty, but so that students and um, counselors and parents can see the various programs that are across the region and how we're really trying to build and support a, a great pathway for this really critically important industry. I know that we didn't have as much time for a Q&A. We had a, so much rich content, but you have our contact information. We encourage you to be in touch with Julie or any of us or any of the partners that were on the call today. And we'll um, try to get responses or um, just incorporate your comments into maybe the meeting summary. So that is uh, actually, we're coming right on up to three. <laughs> which is um, good timing. So any last words on that, Julie? No, thank you all for attending today. And we, again, appreciate our industry partners for taking time out and for our faculty for hanging in there for Friday afternoon. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you, everybody. We'll, we'll hope to see you again soon and be safe.